Probably word is, yeah. Good timing. Yeah, I gotta get some break work done, so <coughs> get ready for winter. Yes. I couldn't hear this mask is pulling my ears down. <laughs> Drives me nuts. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the regular meeting of the DeKalb City Council. October 26th, uh, 2020. <clears throat> Prior to us calling the meeting to order, I would like to first of all make sure that our city clerk can hear us and is online. Lynn Fazekas, I see your name is on the board. Can you hear us? Lynn, you may want to unmute yourself. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you very much. For those of you who are in our audience tonight and would like to speak to any item on the agenda, or for that matter, any item not on the agenda, We'd ask that you kindly fill out a speaker request form. They're available from our executive assistant, uh, Ruth Scott, and uh, we'll get those up uh, to me and we'll get you on at the appropriate time. <clears throat> those who do want to speak to any item on the agenda have the option of speaking either during sections D, public participation, or if you would prefer, you may simply wait until the item on the agenda uh, is uh, before us and you can speak at that point. We also have several people on Zoom. I believe we have one speaker tonight uh, from Zoom who would like to participate remotely. I'm delighted that all of our city council members are with us tonight. And I'd like to ask our city clerk, Lynn Fazekas, to call the roll, please. Morris. Here. Sanukin. Here. Smith. Here. Perkins. Here. McAdam. Here. Furbick. Here. Favor. Here. Mayor Smith. Here. Eight present. Thank you. It's been a couple of months now that we had the search completed for an assistant city manager, and we were delighted to see one name come to the top of the list. We appointed him as our assistant city manager. He spent a number of years with our uh, city police department, so I'd like to ask Josh Bolt to come forward uh, so that you can see him. Uh, he takes a lot of compliments. He necessarily he won't necessarily take criticism, but Josh, if you'd come up and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. If you'd stand. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Josh. <clears throat> Great to have you aboard as our assistant city manager. Okay, I'd like to move along to <coughs> approval of the agenda. Uh, are there any additions or deletions, first of all, to the agenda? Prior to approving the agenda tonight, I would like to, number one, have a motion, number two, have a second, and I understand that we have someone in the audience who would like to speak on the agenda itself. So may I have a motion to approve tonight's agenda? So moved. Second. It's been moved by Alderman Morris, seconded by Alderman Verbeck. And I understand, Mark Sharvat, you'd like to say something about the agenda itself? Just a quick note, 
note there's an error on page six of the agenda narrative where the finance advisory committee's meeting on October 19th is referred to as its regular meeting. No meetings of the finance advisory committee listed on the annual list of meetings published by the city of DeKalb are regular meetings. Therefore, the finance advisory committee does not have regular meetings. So there's a Scribner error there. Okay, thank you. We have a motion on the floor, a second. Any discussion? Roll call. Morris. Yes. Finucan. Yes. Smith. Yes. Perkins. Yes. McAdam. Yes. Fulpick. Yes. Saver. Yes. Mayor Smith. Yes. Eight aye. Thank you. The agenda is approved as printed. We now move along to public participation. We have a number of folks who would like to speak, although I have uh, indications here that only a couple of folks would like to speak early on here in the meeting. The first uh, is, should be with us uh, on Zoom, and that is Amy Levine, who lives at 208 Miller Avenue in DeKalb. Amy, are you with us? <coughs> Amy Levine, are you with us? I'm here. Good. Um, I can't get the video on Zoom to work, however. Okay. Well, we hear you Can loud you and hear me? We hear you loud and clear. If you'd like to make your statement, please. Okay. Um, Increasing diversity among our elected officials at is and should be an objective of the citizens of DeKalb. The slate of officers and in particular older persons who come from DeKalb's different racial, ethnic, economic, and cultural groups is one way to achieve fair and democratic representation. We heard this over and over and over in meetings early this summer. With that aim in mind, I'm dismayed somewhat by the proposal to decrease the already low compensation for elected officials, even though I heartily appreciate your seriousness in considering ways to cut the city's budget and your concern for how this might look if asking for concessions from other city workers. I'm really impressed by the seriousness with which you approach this. I probably don't need to tell you, but for the other citizens listening, all of these positions involve many, many more hours than those spent at regular council meetings like this one. All the persons sit on commissions, they read and prepare documents, they meet with constituents and others working with the city, they attend public events, including those at schools and for our youth, answer emails, prepare reports and informational social media for us, and engage in other duties. While the work some weeks might total five hours, other weeks it could be as much as 25 hours. At the current salary of $5,400 a year, it's possible for an older person to take home less than minimum wage, and that will be worse if we decrease the salaries. Lowering already minimal salaries sends a signal to some that only people who don't really need funds are welcome in these positions. You on council are one visible result of these low stipends, a group that's white and mostly male. As dedicated as you are, you do not reflect the realities of this city's population. As empathetic as you may be, you can't fully understand the range, range of residents' experiences. One of the arguments I've heard is that public service should be its own reward. Whether it's intentional or not, this belief contributes to white supremacy. It's an example of how systemic racism can be almost invisible. I ask. Where did this belief arise? Historically, who is this belief privileged? Who is it excluded? 
Is it reasonable to believe that someone who needs to be fairly compensated for their work isn't committed to the job? Or maybe the conviction like that is just a little bit insulting to hardworking people. I always brought up that there's nothing shameful about needing to work for pay. Three and minutes. That serving the public was an honorable way of doing so. Undercompensating people who serve the public can lead to the response, they don't pay me enough to do this at critical times. That's not an attitude to be fostered among city workers especially for minimal savings to the city of about $3,600 a year. That's just not very much money. Amy, you're so at three and a half minutes. let's keep long-term goals lesson of diversity and effective local governance in mind and drop this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. You're welcome. I hope you can uh, get on Channel 14 on either MetroNet or... Uh, Comcast. I am on Good, and view, and view the rest of the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we have one other uh, person who would like to uh, try to uh, stay within that three-minute limit. He's heard me say that before, and that's Mark Charvat. By the way, we are pleased to announce that there were over 20 participants in our combined wards four and five first virtual citizen meeting that we had last week. As a result of many more email conversations that took place in the coming days and several questions from residents as well as answers from the police chief about uh, policing questions that came up during the meeting, we had a really great turnout and discussion. There was also, I just want to kind of summarize some of the things. There was discussion about the development of South 4th Street, the liquor license at the laundromat, concerns about crime, concerns about infrastructure and housing. Most people listened as this seems to have been a new experience for just about everyone. The video of the session is available online. You can go to the City Barb's website. A link has also been posted on the neighborhood.com uh, website if you're on there as well. Our hope is to continue these meetings with at least one more attempt before the end of the year. Maybe other wards that have similar meetings and concerns or are interested in having meetings. A special thank you goes out to Herb Rubin and Bill Feldman whose technical Zoom expertise gave us the ability to put this together. Citizens getting together to exchange thoughts and concerns is always very helpful. And also, I want to let everybody know there was no staff time involved, uh, no city assistance to put together this meeting, yet uh, the staff does benefit from hearing uh, what the citizens have to say directly. We also would like to thank those elected officials who decided to listen in and participate just by listening in. Mayor Smith was on hand for the meeting, Fourth Ward Alderman, um, Perkins, First Ward Alderman Morris was in attendance. Several South Side DeKalb County board members listened in. Notably absent, unfortunately, was Fifth Ward Alderman Scott McAdams. So Scott, perhaps you would want to join us on our next Fifth Ward meeting in the future. You're more than welcome to join us. Quick other item here, kind of dovetailing on the ward meeting, there was a lot of discussion regarding crime. That was probably the number one thing people discussed. And one of the things that was brought up was the citizen uh, police the citizen portal on the police website. Now for those who don't know, there was a mapping feature which the council discussed back in February, as you might recall, and it we were told this was going to be brought back for discussion. This allows the citizens to see where the crime is at visually represented on a map. That feature has been missing since February, and I know this council said they were going to bring it back to talk about it. and. Uh, I know what um, Mr. McAdams, when he did have a ward meeting back in the good old days, the citizens wanted that feature brought back. And I know some aldermen were concerned that putting little red dots on a map makes the city look bad. You have to be honest with the citizens. Please bring that feature back, so hopefully we can have a discussion about that. Also, it was brought to my attention that uh, you can only access crime data going back 30 days. So why are we limited to the 30-day limit? Thank you much. Thank you, Mark. <coughs> now, is there anyone in the audience who has filled out a speaker request form who would like to make their comments at this time? If not, we will wait until we get to the item on the agenda to which you'd like to speak. Thank you. Moving right along, Item E, presentations. We have no special presentations this evening. 
We have no mayoral appointments this evening. Item G, consent agenda. Our consent agenda, as you know, is usually enacted by one motion. Uh, there's no separate discussion of each and every one of these items unless someone would like to request that, uh, at, in which event the, uh, the agenda item would be removed from the consent. Does anyone have any desire to remove any of these? If not, let me read the consent agenda. Number one, minutes of the regular city council meeting of October 12, 2020. Number two, accounts payable and payroll through October 26, 2020 in the amount of $2,633,694.43. Number three, investment and bank balance summary through August 2020. Number four, year-to-date revenues and expenditures through August 2020. Number five, the Freedom of Act Information Act FOIA report, September 2020. Number six, hospitality recovery program update. And number seven, FY 2020 human services funding third quarter report. I'd entertain a motion to approve tonight's consent agenda. So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved by Alderman Perkins, seconded by Alderman Perkins. Uh, excuse me, moved by Alderman Perkins, seconded by Alderman Finucane. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Finucane. Yes. Smith. Yes. Perkins. Yes. McAdam. Yes. Perfect. Yes. <clears throat> Favor. Yes. Morris. Yes. Mayor Smith. Yes. Eight I. Thank you. The consent agenda is approved as printed. There are no public hearings this evening. Uh, we have one consideration, and that is the consideration of the annual property tax levy in the city of DeKalb. Prior to turning that over to City Manager Nicholas, we have one speaker who would like to speak to this item. Once again, Mark Sharvat. The headline here is, the city wants a 10% increase in property taxes for its coffers. Last week, the Finance Advisory Committee met in this very room and in the exact words of senior FAC member Tom Terezinski, and I'm quoting him now, you can go back and watch the video, quoting now, that's a $600,000 increase, or just about a 10% increase in property taxes on the city portion of the tax bill. The norm that the council had been using was a flat number plus new construction. Tom Terezinski's very own words in this very room here. So. You want to increase property taxes by 10% during a pandemic. You know, people in this community are barely making ends meet. They're visiting food pantries to get their food. You have local restaurant and bar owners and employees who own homes and places of business that are shuttered because of the governor's lockdown orders and the enforcement efforts of our local health department. And you're telling these people, along with your friends and neighbors, you're gonna pay 10% more next year because the city wants the money. Let me give you a Halloween analogy here. You ever see a horror movie where the vampire is stabbed with a wooden stake through the heart? The one thing you never see in the same movie is someone chopping off the vampire's head. The vampire is already dead. That's precisely what you're being asked to do here. These businesses are on the verge of dying. Some, have already, some are already dead, and now you want to charge these businesses an extra 10%? Now, the options presented by our city manager to the FAC, I'm sorry, I'm going to use the phrase absolutely pathetic, Bill. Why was there not a fifth option to consider by the Finance Advisory Committee? All four options presented, presented a tax increase. In fact, option number one, was a 33% property tax increase for the city of DeKalb. Mr. Nicholas prepared background me, uh, material for tonight's meeting. In the material, he fails to mention that FAC member Tom Terezinski desired an option five, which did not exist. Option five would use that flat number plus new construction that would be lowering the rate to 1.1069. 
if you want to keep the tax dollars paid by the citizens in your community exactly the same. That represents the 4.09 township multiplier for 2020. However, option four recommended here that you guys are gonna consider will present a property tax increase for every single property tax owner. This is the largest increase that I can remember that this community has ever seen in 20 years, in a couple of decades. What needs to be done by this council is the willingness to make deep budget cuts which it has failed to do. Freezing salaries of salaried employees is not enough. We need to cut these salaries. Other municipalities have done this. Why DeKalb seems to think they can conduct business as usual absolutely makes no sense. And here we go again. You're at three minutes, Mark. Final sentence here. If you did this, if you cut, made the proper cuts, you could cover the increased pension obligations and you could pay for them from the general fund. 10% tax increase, unreal. Those are Tom Tarasinski's own words. I called him to verify that he said that, so thank you. Thank you, Mark. Okay, with that, City Manager Nicholas. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just gonna draw your attention to a few things in the background and I'd like to dig in on this for you, for the members of the audience, and also for people looking in tonight. Uh, in your background, as, as a matter of reference, I projected a couple of tables here. One is simply to look at last year's breakdown of the different rates that resulted from the levies charged by all the local prop, uh, uh, taxing bodies. And it's on page three of your background. And then below that, uh, the levies and the rate setting EAV for the city going back 10 years. And it gives you some idea of what happens and what has been happening uh, over a, a significant period of time. And then as we dug into this at the FAC, I went to some extent to talk about the ingredients that go into the annual property tax levy from just from the city of DeKalb. Other taxing bodies have other purposes to raise property tax money and the city of DeKalb has traditionally looked to raise money to cover its fiduciary responsibility, that's a scary word, so it's basically our pension obligations and also our debt obligations. And in more recent years, uh, we have not been able to raise enough money uh, to cover our rising st uh, state fire and police pension obligations. And we have been trying, though, to continue to pay the library's GO bond, which is now a little bit less than half a million dollars. In fact, this year it's about $485,000. Uh, but uh, because of COVID and because of the uh, significant drop in, in a variety of city revenues, uh, it's just not gonna be possible uh, to also uh, rely, as Mr. Charbot said, on, on property tax payers who, some of whom are, are really uh, constrained right now in their own family spending. Um, and so before the, the Finance Advisory Committee, the, the options that were proposed are in your background. And the first couple were throwaway clearly and as explained to the Finance Advisory Committee, nobody was contemplating a, seriously a 30% increase or even 20% or even a 10% increase. So, uh, I, but by way of explanation, the reason these were posed is because you can see in option number one, we were covering our fiduciary responsibilities. And I just pointed out what it would cost if we were to do that. It would be uh, about $1.7 million more than option number four was, was presenting for option number one. Option number two, all right, let's cut this debt back to what the actuary says will not gain ground on that 2040 target that we have for our fire and police pension uh, obligation to be 90% funded. Uh, and we're somewhere uh, low, uh, below 50% for our fire and police pension, but it would keep us the same in terms of the percent of the full funding. Uh, but that was also going to uh, push our property tax up over a million dollars. And then levy option number three that was posed to the Finance Advisory Committee was uh, seven million and again, too much, but we were trying to pay a little bit of the library bond 
uh, with a lower allocation for the fire and police pension. And finally, option number four that was presented to the Finance Advisory Committee was to say, all right, we'll pay all of the library bond out of the general fund revenues, which is basically out of the reserve. Uh, we will only pay a fractional amount of that money that should go to the fire and police pensions. And you come to that number of $6,865,743. Now, that resulting rate, based on what we think will be the community-wide EAV, was going to be about 2.7, 2.8% lower than it was last year. It was going to be 1.223%, except we find ourselves in an unusual circumstance. The township multiplier is 4.09. So instead of seeing an actual out-of-pocket net drop in, the, in, in, in some dollars paid to the city, we were going to see an increase in the dollars paid. So uh, what do we do and why is there a multiplier? What is that? So a lot of people don't, don't know, but uh, township assessors are obligated to take note of the Department of Revenue's guidance every year on how to equalize the assessed valuation of property within the region. What does that mean? It means because in our case today, because uh, property values have been rising because home sales are, are hot right now and have been increasing in, in value over the last three trailing years, there has to be an adjustment up across the whole tax base in the township. 4.09%, that affects businesses, homeowners, and, and others. 4.09%, so that's a big jump. If, if, if uh, we only look to increase our, our levy based on a percent that would get us below last year's rate, we would still be increasing the net out-of-pocket dollars that homeowners and businesses would have to pay. And that's the dilemma. That's not something we control. Now, there have been multipliers in the past. The last time there was a multiplier of this size that is actually higher was in the very uh, hothouse uh, conditions of the early 2000s before the crash in 2007, 2008. Uh, and at that point, uh, I, I believe in one of the years, it was up to around seven and a half, eight percent. That was a multiplier, it was a lot. By the same token, in 2011, I believe, the multiplier was down about that much uh, it's because the three trailing years of eight, nine, and 10 were so dismal and there was a drop in the valuation of the community's wealth. Okay, that's all the, by way of background. So where are we? Well, uh, the Finance Advisory Committee uh, uh, supported the city manager's recommendation, and the city manager's position at that time, my position at that time, was we are dipping into our reserve, which also affects our local taxpayers, and we're trying to remain liquid so that we get into next year, and if we continue to have the, the drag that we have on our revenue and so forth in order to maintain services, which people say they want us to do, uh, we'd have to go even deeper. And if we don't get our, any kind of resolution to stay level with fire and police pensions, deeper still. And how would it be next year uh, when we see some new, uh, uh, new value to our tax base because of Ferrara and Facebook, if our rate all of a sudden had to jump to balance the book. So there's a balancing act here. It was with no relish or enthusiasm that I recommended a rate, even though lower, that might result in uh, an increase in out-of-pocket contributions to the, to the city. Now, how much would that be? Um, I've got a couple slides for you. And first, I took my property tax bill, and then I'm going to describe, I didn't, think you want to look at a lot of graphs. What it would be like for the uh, median household uh, value in the city of DeKalb. So I don't know if, can you see this in the audience? Is this big enough? I don't know if it is. I don't know. Can, is this working? Can you see that? Okay. Okay. Let's just follow this along. So, the Nicholas House in 2019 had an EAV of 
I have a homestead exemption, most local homeowners do. That's six thousand um, dollars. That meant my net taxable value, that's the EAP, one third of the market value, is ninety-five thousand three hundred forty-three dollars. And that's a pretty accurate number because I just bought my house in Decal in October of last year, so this came out about that time. And at, last year at the 2019 tax rate of 1.15493, uh, the amount of, of taxes I paid to the city for both the uh, bond, there's a portion of it that went to the bond, and then also that went to the fire and police pensions, was $1,101.14. Okay. So we have a 4.09% township multiplier. That runs my taxable net value up to $99,488. And even though the rate is lower, look what happens. There's a higher number there, $1,216.55. If we went with option number four, that's what I would be paying. I don't say this because I'm feeling bad about that. I'm saying this is what the actual fact difference of $118. That's an increase out of my pocket. Now the average, uh, according, according to uh, the, the local realtors, and we haven't had a census in 10 years, but we had a special census and we we're going to get some more census data, but in order to go to the bond market in the last month, the numbers we got from Moody's for our area and the, and the Federal Reserve show that the median, so that right in the middle, those of you who know statistics, of, if, of every property, every house property in, in town was 154,000 and change in 2020. So take a third of that, we're at 51,000, all right? 51,000. If you take 51,000, does the average, uh, oops, Jeff, can you push that back? Did I do that? Thank you. We're off the page there. 51,000, and if that, that household had a $6,000 homestead exemption of 6,000, we get to 45,000. Are you with me? 45,000 times last year's uh, rate would have required the payment of about $520 to the city, okay? So at a equalizer of 1.049, so 4.9 percent, that raises that $45,000 net taxable value to 47205 And if you take the new proposed rate of the 1.1223 times that, you get $530. So that's an increase of $11. $11, but it's still an increase. All right. So I have, a, I have a new levy option for you. Go to the next slide, please. Or I just run this up, Jeff. Go to the bottom of this. I'm sorry, I didn't see it on there. Okay. So at the FAC meeting, Mr. Tarasinski thought that if we got somewhere to around, as Mr. Shabbat, Shabbat said, about the 1.069, I believe it was, uh, we would have uh, basically hit the sweet spot, a balance, where, where the people at the mid-range like me or people who are at the average of, of uh, 154,000 should be paying actually less out of pocket in their property tax to the city alone. I, we can't speak for what the school district will do and the park district and uh, the town is over. Okay, so uh, what I've proposed here, and I propose for you tonight, and I think it's pretty straightforward, I basically took 5% off the top, and, and what we've got here is an increase of 4% in the levy of $252,807, in in, sorry, $252,807. And it would be a levy of six million five hundred twenty-two thousand four hundred fifty-six. And the council has copies. It's the third table on the bottom. Okay. Yeah. 
and the rate that results from that uh, will be 1.0662. And the difference, and here I've, I've got my own uh, EAV. Where is it? It's not working. Oh, there it is. Hmm. Sorry. It's in, it's in, uh, it's at the bottom in the green there. You can see uh, where we end up. It's about a 40 dollar drop in actual taxes, but the actual rating decrease is 7.68 percent. 7.68 percent. That's the lowest rate increase we've had in a long time. And you can look at that earlier in your in your background. You can see what's happened with the rate. Uh, I, I think this this is a sound way to go and. You're making a decision tonight not only about individual property owners, but also about what happens to the property tax that comes to the city. What do we do with it? So now, Jeff, can we go up to the next, next slide number two, or slide number three, please? Okay, there's that six million five in blue. Do you see the blue? Sorry, the pointer's on. Oh, there we go. Look at that. Wow. Huh? Go back. Go to slide number three, please, Jeff. Is that it? Okay. Oh, let go of the button. <laughs> there we go. Okay. See that? Right there. All right. So, what is this chart about? Uh, this chart breaks down all of the city's general fund revenues, and you can see where the property tax comes in. Right there. Uh, we are going to have a total revenue for our general fund of $36,239,761. If, and that's, that's uh, a couple million, 2.5 million less than our budget for the, the current year. It is an increase of about 1.4 million over where I think we're gonna end up this year, which has a lot of ifs to it, as we all know, what will happen with the hospitality businesses in between now and and through the holidays and so forth. But that's the best we have to go on. Okay, let's go down. Just page down a little bit, Jeff, so that we can get to the spending side. Okay, that's a revenue side, but this is actually a double whammy. So what we save on the top has to come out of somewhere to pay the bond and, and the, and the, uh, the uh, fire and police pensions. Now go to slide number four, please, Jeff, if you would. So here is just a, a quick look at where we, we would have been if we wanted to go with option number four. This, there are two, two tables here. The top table had the city levy of 6.865 million. Uh, and that shows we were going to pay more uh, in here in the, the levy for the, these are just fire and police pension. The, uh, the, the bond payment for the library is not on the table, okay? If you look over here, the difference was 1,031,368. So see what happens when we add the 343,000, you see that yellow? So that's gotta be paid. Uh, the, this number, this 7.897, which is the same as whatever the levy is, has to be paid. That's what it means by being a fiduciary responsibility. And so the levy, you see, we went down. So we have to come out of our general fund reserve with that. We've increased the take out of the reserve by $343,287. That's our only rainy day fund. That's our liquidity for this year, for next year, for whatever happens. On the way in today, I was listening on Bloomberg uh, Financial News. So uh, what are the uh, medical experts saying now? Uh, they're saying even with, with uh, the onset of a vaccine and so forth and better testing and all the rest of that, instead of being the third quarter of 2021, which is what we thought we were we're planning on. It looks like it might be the end of the year, 2021, before we really level off and businesses can reopen and so forth. That's, that's, a, that's a darker prediction. 
than what we had just a couple months ago. Uh, and we can see the closing of the hospitality businesses has not has not dampened the ramp of increase in, in new cases. So uh, there, there's, there's a lot more to it. There's a lot of layers out there and causation. So the short of all this, and I know I've been going on for a while, is that I recommend option, the new option that I presented to you tonight. I talked to Lynn Neely uh, this afternoon, uh, the, the chair of the Finance Advisory Committee, to brief her. And no one on the committee is going to complain about having a lower levy, but she wanted to know where we were on this chart. And I explained that I thought we had enough cushion. But if you look, and now go up to uh, uh, file number four, please, Jeff. Or three, I'm sorry, we're on four. Three. With what I've proposed tonight, Go up a little higher, Jeff, or the other way. <laughs> there, you go. there you go. So we, we have a policy that says we have to have a balanced budget, and we also have a policy that we should have 25% of our annual general fund expenditures in reserve. So we went from, on the reserve side, we went from almost 30% down to this number, which still looks okay in terms of percentage. But look at the dollar number. Now we're down to $364,581. You forgave more than that to, in terms of uh, restaurant bar tax, to our hospitality businesses back in March. So it only takes a couple of months of no revenue to get us down to the break-even point. So I say we can't go any lower than that, even though some of us would like to have the even lower taxes, but, and who wouldn't? But I, I think balancing everything together, uh, what we need to maintain services, what we need to, to meet our, our pension obligations and the, and the debt obligations, and taking into account the great majority of property taxpayers in this town, I think what I presented to you tonight is the best option. And I'd like your support for that, because we're, we're just two weeks away from presenting you with a, a draft budget uh, for review for um, five or six days before we actually get into our um, uh, pretty intense meetings on the 16th and 18th of November. So we need to know pretty quickly. Uh, this was new information to you, but the, the, the essentials are pretty clear. Lower taxes for out-of-pocket. It's, it's not hundreds of dollars, but it's lower than what people paid last year. And the rate is significantly lower, and the uh, by almost eight percent. And in the middle of COVID, as it was said, uh, that's pretty remarkable. Uh, balancing other things against that. Now, there's always a caveat, and here's the caveat: uh, with that 4.09 uh, percent equalizer uh, multiplier. Um, I think our EAV expectation for next year, the $611,750,000, is pretty safe, but we don't know. There's, right now, we're coming into the time for uh, property tax appeals. And last year, there were more appeals that were upheld than we ever expected. And so we were a little bit off, not a lot, in our EAV. But that's one of the key factors in determining what the rate is, obviously. And if there is a significant drop in that, then it, it does affect the rate. It's not quite as low. And uh, so uh, we, I, I just mentioned that. That's something we don't control. I think we've taken a conservative approach to that. I'll answer any questions. Before we turn it over for any questions, um, and I'm sure there will be some, because what, what I think Bill needs tonight is a consensus on whether or not we agree that his new option five makes some sense. Following the Finance Advisory Committee's decision to go with another option, which had a considerably higher uh, a rate. Alderman Smith and I were at the FAC meeting, and we heard the discussion. Following that meeting, I know at least I had a discussion with City Manager Nicholas 
And we were talking about the very same thing, and that is that, you know, folks feel like they're taxed up the wazoo. And at that point, prior to his conversation with our township tax assessor from DeKalb Township, uh, and some of that information came forward in his presentation tonight, I felt that we needed to do something akin to what I think City Manager Nicholas has come up with tonight. So I'm very satisfied that we've expanded on what we brought to the Finance Advisory Committee and I appreciate uh, their chewing on this and spitting out something back to us what we felt at that time without some of this additional information made sense. So I don't know if that makes sense or not, but I'll turn it over to any, uh, any discussion. Any, any, council, any council members? Alderman Perkins. I really like what you did, Bill, <clears throat> where you brought a specific example in and walked through it to demonstrate the impact, the real impact, because there's a lot of numbers here, a lot of different ratios, but I think, I thank you for that. I think it clarifies things for, for me and hopefully for a lot of other folks as well. Thank you. Uh, Alderman uh, Verbing. And it's very responsive to the feedback that I've received so far from uh, Ward 6. Uh, phone conversation last night that touched on uh, these elements and uh, all I will say is thank you, Bill. This option is uh, ideal for uh, what we have ahead of us and uh, keeps us uh, with that ability to provide high quality services along the way. Anything else? So uh, City Manager Nicholas, basically you're looking for some kind of consensus that this makes sense and then this will be brought back in, in the form of uh, uh, part and parcel of the budget uh, for 2021. That's correct. Okay, consider the sen consensus tonight. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, now we have several resolutions. Item J, the first one is resolution 2020-113, authorizing an intergovernmental agreement, thank you. with DeKalb Township Road District pertaining to roadway construction responsibilities. I'd entertain a motion, please. So, so moved. Second. It's been moved by Alderman Fanukin, seconded by Alderman Favor. City Manager Nicholas, please. Thank you, Mayor. I think this is pretty straightforward. Uh, we have, for decades and decades work collaboratively with uh, our uh, township partners and in this case uh, uh, we're talking about the DeKalb Township Road District and, and our public works departments and, and we do uh, snow removal and, and we touch and overlap and, and we do things I think very pragmatically so that everybody um, benefits and there's, there's an agreement here, it's an intergovernmental agreement to deal with the, the year before us, the, the the snow season before us, and uh, the various responsibilities are spelled out in detail. Uh, probably going forward, this may be the last uh, intergovernmental agreement uh, because this is so, so operationally baked in that it's probably something that if we ever had a problem, we'd be back to you, but I don't think that that's likely. But uh, we recommend your, your support and approval. Great. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Smith. Yes. Perkins. Yes. McAdam. Yes. Furbick. Yes. Favor. Yes. Morris. Yes. Sanukin. Yes. Mayor Smith. Yes. Thank you. That resolution is approved. 
Number two, Resolution 2020-114, authorizing a real estate purchase agreement with City Hall Suites, LLC, for the sale of real property located at 200 South 4th Street in the amount of $600,000, Johan DeKalb Suites. Motion, please. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Alderman McAdams, seconded by Alderman Favor. Prior to City Manager Nicholas making a few remarks, we do have a couple of speakers, or folks who would like to speak to this item. The first one, on behalf of Bessie Chronopolis, Mark Sharvat. I should start with the usual Bessie. Ay, ay, ay. She's right about this, though, and this, these are her comments, by the way. The fact that this entire proposal involving City Hall's move and subsequent proposal for an erect, erecting an apartment building in this square block has been rushed and pushed through with little public input from the beginning over a year ago is simply bad governance and can easily be referred to as a done deal. Thankfully, citizens stepped forward at the planning and zoning meeting along with concerns from veteran planning zoning members resulted in some alterations to the original plan. Regardless of these alterations, this matter should rightfully go back to the planning and zoning committee and be vetted by that body whose function is to advise the mayor and council. There is no question that citizens stepping forward will be helpful in protecting the neighborhood to some degree. What is sad is an unforgivable and unforgivable is the fact that City Hall did not function as it should have to protect the interests of citizens whose investment in their properties is an important part of the local economy. City Hall resources should be used to protect the homeowner, not just the interests of a single developer. Good governance requires fairness and transparency, and this City Hall has not learned its lessons. Those comments from Bessie. Now, I'll add my two cents here. I have a problem with the numbers involved here. The fact that we're giving out $750,000 in tax increment financing, and Pappas is paying $600,000 for this property, something like that. I'm sorry, those numbers don't add up to me. Would you, would you invest in something like that where you put forth $750,000 and you got back six hundred? dollars Bad math on this. Um, when I watched the Planning and Zoning Committee meeting, I saw the citizens come up. And the, the citizens who spoke were generally not in favor of this. And I believe the decision of the Planning and Zoning Commission was 3-3. So the fact that uh, in this proposal, J3 and L2, it says the Planning and Zoning Committee voted 3-3, but recommendation, it's the recommendation. That sounds like a tie to me, which means it needs to go back to the Planning and Zoning Committee for further vetting. So I don't think we're ready to move on this yet. And I'm concerned personally about where are all these cars going to go? Where's the parking going to take place there? The fact that the residents were not happy with this deal, gosh, I'm sorry. If I lived around there, I would want residents, I would want homeowners in that area, not more apartments. You know, you want people who are invested in the community. Residents tend to be more life, lifelong investors in the property. Apartment owners tend to come here and go. So that's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Bessie and Mark. Rita and John McNett, would you like to speak, please? Hi there. Hello. So we were at the zoning, can I take this down? Um, at the zoning committee meeting and expressed our concern. We live directly across from the building on the right, um, the single building, and directly across from it. And so we expressed our concerns, and John and Fody heard everything that we said um, to the point where we have been emailing daily back and forth with what we would like to see, even as far as what color brick, um, what type of windows, what color trim. Um, they have cut back the number of units um, quite a bit. 20 some units have been cut back. They've added the gardens. They've left the gardens back in. They've cut back on the garages. Um, we look at it every single day. So for, you, for that to be said about the residents, we are fully in agreement with what the proposal is. Um, and we, look, we will be looking at it for the rest of our lives. We know it will be maintained. 
Um, we know that um, John and Fody listened to what we've said, and um, we are in full support of it. Absolutely. That's, that's, gonna, that's all I'm going to add. We're, John's been fantastic with listening to us and, and our neighbors, and he's been over backwards, I, I think, we think, mm -hmm. his, his design change. Hell, he dropped one whole building from the plant, so he went from four buildings to three buildings. Right. That's a that was a big co commitment to to us from John. So we fully support it as being somebody like she said that we'll be looking at the rest of our lives. Thank you. We have one other speaker who would like to speak tonight to this item on the agenda. But let me say this: I was at the meeting where you folks spoke, and with John and Fody there, and. You know, if you've heard me say once, you've heard me say a dozen times, collaboration and communication, it is so darn important. And I was so impressed when I heard that a group of neighbors were able to meet with the Pappas development folks and came up with a meeting of the minds. You know what, when, when these things happen, I don't think everybody gets completely <clears throat> satisfied with what they want, but the meeting of the minds is so important. So thank you. Thank you for coming back. I think that shows a lot about who you are, frankly, that you came back after talking vociferously against what you saw initially. And now after having spoken out and met with the folks, you came back with a, with a, with a changed stance. And, Believe me, I appreciate that. Now, we do have a virtual speaker, so uh, I'm going to ask our IT folks to, if you'd put the Zoom information back up, and I understand that we have Kat Prescott who would like to speak. Kat, are you there and can hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can okay. you hear me? Okay, right. I, we hear you. You've got three minutes or less. Thank you. All right. First of all, I want to thank the work of Pappas and the citizens and the council to come to a more agreeable form of the proposed development in the blocks between 4th and 5th Street containing the old municipal building and large public garden. I am overjoyed to learn that the space occupied by the community garden will continue to be public space. I understand that the form of this public space might change over the years but it's so important that we continue to have space that is for all in the neighborhood. Old growth trees not only surround the perimeter of the lot, but are within it as well. That's a feature that cannot be purchased and cannot be built. Furthermore, outdoor activities are among the only possible ways for humans to see each other and experience time outside their houses right now. That said, there are a few more concerns that I want the council to hear. We are in the middle of what is becoming a long-term pandemic. While the WHO and the CDC are suggested that HVAC systems might not spread the virus as previously feared, feared, these health organizations are in agreement that shared hallways, gym spaces, and so forth definitely do spread both this virus and all others. The proposed POPIS development plans to have such spared, shared spaces in high density housing. I hope that the development contains a plan for the management of safety of the people who would potentially live in these buildings. Lastly, perhaps leastly, I personally have a stake in this as this is my home as well. I'm concerned about the safety of 50 plus vehicles deposited right in front of my house. Where many of my neighbors and I walk every day, this development as it was laid out has made my location manifestly more unsafe with one of the most common causes of injury and death, the automobile. This isn't just a matter of not wanting my attractive view to change. If the exit for traffic is onto 4th Street where it does not face housing or Grove Street where there are trees and parking lots and businesses, neighborhood residents would be objectively safer. Our children would be objectively safer. Given the change that preserves community space, I am very happy to consider this development as part of my neighborhood. But these details are very important to me, my family, and my whole community. Please consider asking for more changes. Thank you, Kat. 
Okay, uh, let's move along now. We've had a motion on the floor, a second. Uh, we've had uh, public participation and public input uh, yet this evening. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to City Manager Nicholas, after which we can have some further discussion. Thank you, Mayor. There are three items on your agenda tonight that touch right. on this particular property. Uh, the first that's before you right now uh, is the purchase agreement. And, and back in September, when the, the council unanimously approved the, the selection of the, the Pappas redevelopment proposal, it was, it was uh, stated, uh, I stated, that there would be other pieces to come back. One would be the purchase agreement. Uh, another uh, would, would be obviously the rezoning piece, which is the last item on your agenda. And then also the TIF agreement that uh, obviously goes with the, the TIF uh, uh, proposal. So uh, the first one before you tonight uh, is the purchase agreement. And that's pretty straightforward. It, it, it follows other purchase agreements you've seen here with the sale of city property over the last couple of years. Uh, there is a proposed uh, uh, purchase offer of $600,000. Uh, that would be held in, uh, uh, held on deposit uh, and credited to the buyer at the closing. The closing, though, is contingent upon the approval of the development proposal and and uh, also the TIP proposal. So uh, we have to take we have to take them though in in sequence. And there is language in the purchase agreement. And there will be in the TIP proposal that um, alerts the the reader to the fact that there is a third piece that. Uh, f failing to get support would negate uh, the, the, the purchase and, and the TIF proposal. So you can go ahead and vote up or down on this uh, without jeopardizing decisions that you might want to make later on. So this, this particular proposal, I believe, is in the city's best interest and uh, I recommend your approval. And I'll do my best to see that we have it in the proper sequence, okay? <laughs> okay, so... Uh, We've had motion on the floor, public participation, city manager's description, discussion now. Alderman Fanukin. You know, Bill mentioned the uh, meeting that we had in September where we discussed this. And at that time, uh, the discussion regarding the three options that were presented that this was the best uh, long-term financial option for the city. Uh, Mr. Shabbat mentioned the difference between what we're going to give in TIF versus what they're paying for the property. But in the long term, this versus the uh, single family housing was offered or the other project by Mr. Mason, this had the best long term financial return for the city of DeKalb. And I think that's why council supported it as much as we did. Uh, and, and I think that's something important to keep as we move along with this, uh, with the proposals this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Finucane. Any other discussion? If not, roll call, please. Great, Excuse me. I'm sorry. Great. Alderman Perkins. I just want to say kudos to, to the folks in the ward who spoke up, had your voices heard, um, influenced the process, and actually changed the outcome. Beautiful thing to see. Kudos. Amen. Alderman uh, Verbeek. Was the option that Kat Prescott brought up uh, considered? She mentioned no. Okay. It's not safer. No way to smoke. Fire will loosen everything up. You want to open up a discussion here, Alvin and Verbeek? No, no. He's described it. I was just wondering. Are you if, satisfied? If, yes. Because if so, I was going to ask John. Oh, no, no. That's fine. Yeah. All right. Any further discussion? Roll call. Perkins. Yes. McAdams. Yes. Verbeck. Yes. Saver. Yes. Morris. Yes. Finucan. Yes. Smith. Yes. Mayor Smith. Yes. Eight aye. Thank you. That resolution is approved. 
Number three, Resolution 2020-115, authorizing a redevelopment agreement with City Hall Suites, LLC, for redevelopment of property located at 200 South 4th Street, Johan de Kelb Suites. Motion, please. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Alderman McAdams, seconded by Alderman Favor. City Manager Nicholas, please. Thank you, Mayor. If you've had a chance to look at the, the background, uh, uh, the agreement that is in their background is uh, in the same format as other TIF agreements that we have done here in the last couple of years. And there is a clawback in the sense that if the projected uh, increment uh, does not in 20 years offset the, the, uh, the $750,000 forgivable loan, that uh, then uh, that whatever balance outstanding uh, existed would be due immediately. But that's not likely to happen. Um, the, uh, you may recall in the comparison of the three proposals, this is by far, as, as uh, Alderman Fanuka mentioned, uh, most uh, productive in terms of annual tax increment. And uh, the proposal is uh, going to generate around $200,000 a year in new increment. Uh, after all, there's no property tax being paid on this site now and hasn't been since the late 60s. And so it, it's, it's all pure in that sense. And anything that's done, even the demolition of the building and the cleaning of the lot would generate some tax if it's privately owned. So uh, we are going to see a, a big payoff for this that more than offsets the um, $750,000 loan, which is the the, the heart of this particular redevelopment agreement, and we recommend your support. Okay, Alderman Morris. Um, I have a question. I don't know if I overlooked something here, uh, and it's not largely material, but I'm, did I just see that it's, has the name been changed from Johan Suites to um, City Hall Suites? Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Morris. Any other discussion? Roll call, please. Mickey Adam. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Favor. Yes. Morris. Yes. Sanuka. Yes. Smith. Yes. Perkins. Yes. Mayor Smith. Yes. Eight I. Thank you. That resolution is approved. Resolution number four, resolution 2020 116, authorizing a purchase agreement with Midwest Salt Company for the purchase of clear southern rock salt for a period of one year from January 1, 2021 through December 31, 2021, for, for the purpose of treating the city's drinking water. Motion, please. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Alderman Smith, seconded by <coughs> Alderman Verbeek. City Manager Nicholas, please. This resolution and the next one involve uh, some chemicals that we add to make your water cleaner and taste sweeter. Uh, this one in particular deals with uh, the, the rock salt which is used to soften the, the city's potable water supply. Uh, we've got a very good price from the company that currently has the contract and uh, that uh, $110 per ton price uh, is one we hope you will support. It's, uh, it's a standout in the, in the industry right now, so we recommend your support of this resolution. Discussion? Roll call. Verbeek. Yes. Favor. Yes. Morris. Yes. Sanukin. Yes. Smith. Yes. Perkins. Yes. McAdams. Yes. Mayor Smith. Yes. 8 I. Thank you. That resolution is approved. 
Number five, resolution 2020-117, authorizing a purchase agreement for Care, uh, with Keras Corporation for the purchase of phosphate for a period of three years from January 1, 2021 through December 31, 2023 for the purpose of treating the city's work drinking water. Motion, please. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Alderman <coughs> Favor, seconded by Alderman Perkins. City Manager Nicholas, please. We move from salt to uh, orthopoly blended phosphate, <coughs> a phrase that doesn't just roll off the tongue <laughs> so easily. But uh, this is an, a key ingredient that we have uh, uh, that will basically freeze any iron that will build up in, inside ductile <coughs> iron pipes. Uh, and keeps it from entering into the stream of, of the water and leading to um, my, you know, coloring in the water and so forth. Uh, it's long been a, an additive. Uh, we went to the market, the company that currently has our contract uh, last, this current year was charging 41 cents a pound. They've gone up to 42 cents a pound. Uh, they're still, uh, substantially lower than the nearest bidder. Uh, we, uh, despite that fractional increase, we, we believe it's a very fair price and recommend your approval. Any discussion? Roll call. Favor. Yes. Morris. Yes. Sanukin. Yes. Smith. Yes. Perkins. Yes. McAdams. Yes. Verdick. Yes. Mayor Smith. Yes. Eight I. That resolution is approved. On our agenda, item six, resolution 2020-118, authorizing <laughs> the waiver of competitive bidding and the execution of an agreement with Lane Christensen Company for the repair and replacement of well parts and equipment in an amount not to exceed $61,162. I'd entertain a motion, please. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Alderman Perkins, seconded by Alderman McAdams. Any discussion? Roll call. Morris. Yes. Sanukin. Yes. Smith. Yes. Perkins. Yes. McAdam. Yes. Verbeck. Yes. Favor. Yes. Mayor Smith. Yes. Eight I. Thank you. That resolution is approved. Number seven, resolution twenty twenty dash one one nine, authorizing a standard agreement for the Crawford Murphy and Tilly Incorporated or with Crawford Murphy and Tilly Incorporated for construction services at Illinois airports for design special services and construction phase engineering to resurface runway 2-20 at the DeKalb Taylor Municipal Airport. Motion. So moved. Second. Been moved by Alderman Favor, seconded by Alderman McAdams. City Manager Nicholas. Uh, just to say the uh, Consulting firm, engineering consulting firm of Crawford, of Murphy and Tilly has been working with us for a number of years now. They are, are the designated uh, agent for us in, in uh, this particular project, uh, which is the crack filling and uh, the, it's really combined. They're gonna do crack filling and then uh, do the resurfacing of runway 220. That's a newer runway, the Northeast Southwest runway. And that will be done uh, in 2021. Uh, this is all part of a, a sweep of, of federal and state processes. And we're at the point where the, the council needs to authorize the mayor to sign documents, uh, allowing us to go to the next step, which is just maybe two steps away from the actual bidding, which should happen in February. So we recommend your support. Thank you. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Sanukin. Yes. Smith. Yes. Perkins. Yes. 
McAdams. Yes. Verbeck. Yes. Favor. Yes. Morris. Yes. Mayor Smith. Yes. Eight I. That resolution is approved. Number eight, resolution 2020-120, approving a first amendment to the water agreement between the city of DeKalb and Gold Frame LLC to correct a scrivener's error. Project Ventus, Facebook Data Center. Motion, please. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Alderman McAdams, seconded by Alderman Verbeck. <coughs> City Manager Nicholas. Uh, you recall back in April, a number of uh, ordinances came your way that uh, paved the, the, the road for our annexation, rezoning, and, and development agreements relating to the Facebook project. And at the time, uh, we couldn't say who they were. And uh, Gold Frame was the uh, corporate LLC that was doing business uh, uh, as, as a point for Facebook at that point. And, and they were also involved in the document that is, is uh, the subject of this particular resolution, which was the water agreement, which was designed, uh, first of all, to acknowledge that we have good water and abundant water, and also that we would be willing, because of the large pumping capacity, to set aside a certain capacity so that if, if there was some catastrophic failure, there would be some way for them to continue to operate uh, the, uh, in the business that now we know who they are, Facebook is in. Uh, you, you don't see messages on the internet saying, I'm sorry, uh, uh, we, uh, excuse our dust or uh, excuse our, our being out of service for a couple of days. It doesn't happen. Uh, it doesn't happen ever. So uh, water is one of the reasons why they, it, it helps cool their, their buildings. And there was a, a Scrivener's error in one of the illustrative graphs in the exhibit. Uh, kudos to them for finding it. We, none of us found it. And, uh, all the people and the layers of, of experts looking at this at the time, uh, in order, it's been recorded on our end. Uh, according to the uh, original document, if there's to be any change, a comma, a period, or whatever, then both parties have to approve it. So we bring it to you to be approved. This is the first, and hopefully it's the only one. And uh, we ask for your unanimous support. Paperwork, paperwork. No, yeah, that's important. <laughs> Any discussion? Roll call, please. Smith. Yes. Perkins. Yes. McAdams. Yes. <clears throat> Perfect. Yes. Favor. Yes. Morris. Yes. Finucan. Yes. Mayor Smith. Yes. Eight aye. That completes our consideration of our resolutions this evening. We now move to ordinances. We have one on second reading and one on first reading. The one on or second reading is number one, ordinance 2020-064, establishing revised compensation and benefits for the elected officials of the city of DeKalb. Uh, we've already had uh, uh, Amy Levine, who uh, spoke uh, on this uh, ordinance uh, earlier this evening. We do have two folks in our audience tonight who would like to speak to it. The first one is Steve Capitan. First of all, let me have a motion uh, on that floor. So for moved. This. Second. It's been moved by Alderman Fanukan, seconded by Alderman McAdams. Now, Steve Capitan. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I echo the concerns expressed earlier by Amy Levine about the lack of diversity of elected officials that such low salaries uh, will ensure continues. Um, the current council compensation is $100 per year more than it was 30 years ago. Set by the council at $5,300 per year in 1990. Let me repeat that. The current council compensation is $100 per year more than it was 30 years ago. Set by the council at $5,300 per year in 1990. If those of you who support this are trying to set an example to city staff, 
in these times of difficult budget challenges, the savings will be a drop in the bucket. I'm sure nobody, even Mr. Charvat, would suggest that city staff salaries should be reduced to a level below what they were 30 years ago. Please reject this empty gesture. And by the way, you still haven't addressed the unsustainable status of the city clerk. Thank you, Steve. The aforementioned Mark Charvat. I can tell you for once, it's kind of nice to actually agree with what the mayor had to say at the last meeting. So I, I'm <laughs> actually on his side with this one. I, I think you guys are very misguided on this because you're talking about you, you, you changed the ordinance to lower it from 5% to 10%. And I've been hearing this whole, we're all in this together. Where is the 10% reduction for city staff or all the bargaining units? I heard at the Finance Advisory Committee that the salaries may remain level for the bar some of the bargaining units, but I don't see a 10% cut that we're doing there. Let's be honest, it's not happening. Um, may, if you were to lower, I'll tell you what, if you were to lower everybody's salaries 10% across the board, I might be in favor of this, but you're not going to do this. In fact, the city of DeKalb, I think I saw on one of the Alderman's Facebook pages, we're hiring another management analyst. We've gotten along just fine without another middle management individual here with the city, so why not forego that hire? You've been getting along just fine without that. I also remind the mayor that uh, something you have never done in your term, which you could do if you wanted, the mayoral veto. Consider using it for this one. Um, and as uh, Mr. Capitan suggested, we still have not addressed the status of the city clerk. The city clerk, the voters have actually spoken out on this two times. They want, number one, an elected city clerk. And I don't know about you guys, but I've always appreciated when we had a full-time elected city clerk. That is all. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Uh, if you recall, we passed this by a 42 vote on the last meeting during first reading. We've had a lot of discussion on it. And let's continue with more. Uh, I'd open it up to any discussion, please. Alderman Verbeek. Well, I was not able to join you the last time this was discussed, uh, but uh, the way I've continued to view the compensation for elected officials is that it should reflect the movement of uh, the, the general city staff. So if we're talking with city staff and we're discussing the potential for a freeze, then I believe the elected officials should also be faced with a freeze. Uh, to Mr. Capitan's point, I agree that elected officials' wages could also be considered uh, for an increase over time. So uh, as time goes on, as things improve, uh, our revenues improve and it's responsible to do so, I believe that elected officials should be considered for similar increases that city staff receive. So. Uh, the way that this reads this evening, I will not support it because I just simply support freezing the elected official's wage. Alderman McAdams. So I agree with Michael in that uh, these are difficult times and that in the future we may consider raising the salaries, but right now we are addressing the situation as it is. We have landed $1.3 billion in investment and we have not seen a dime of it yet. But the money is coming. So better days are coming for DeKalb. And when that happens, when those funds are available, we can address it. Right now, we have to live in the world in which we live, in which we are facing unprecedented economic and health crises. And I'm sure we can come back to it. You'll never have a hard time asking elected officials to raise their own salary. Any further discussion? Alderman Favor. So what a difference four years makes. Former sixth ward alderman uh, David Baker was proposing four years ago that we raise our salary um, and that, that didn't receive any votes at that time. Um, 
Yeah, I'm kind of torn on this. I I certainly understand, you know, showing that we are, you know, taking a cut. Um, I'm also not in agreement. I, I don't agree that the wage is what's limiting um, participants in the aldermanic races. Um, at the current salary, it, which if this vote is defeated, at the current salary, two years ago, three out of four of the aldermanic races ran unopposed. Now, when they started, they had, you know, two or three candidates, but by the time the polling took place, you know, there, the others dropped out. So I don't think it's a matter of pay. I mean, I look at uh, our boards and our commissions. Uh, they're staffed with volunteers. We have a very diverse group. Uh, I look at the DeKalb School Board. Uh, they don't receive pay. They're a diverse group. Um, you know, there's, I think there's more to it than the pay. I, I do understand that the pay does help. Um, you know, for those that need child care and, and uh, are, aren't able to work you know, or they work off hours, um, that this might impact. Um, so yeah, it's, it's going to be, it, I'm still, I, I think I'm probably going to vote no. Um, I, we just keep things the same. Thank you, Alderman Favor. Alderman Perkins. Again, I'd like to pe thank the people for, for speaking up. You know, I had a different view of it the first time through, um, and it was that we could lead from the front by saying, you know what, that if we're asking for cuts for other people, it's only fair that we take on something too. And in no way did I want see it as a way of um, maintaining the status quo or repressing anyone. So I think people's voices matter and speaking up is just again it's influenced how I how I viewed the viewed things so thank you thank you Alderman Perkins Alderman Smith I it's funny how something when you try and reduce what you pay uh, people come out of the woodwork and say they should be raising councils salaries I've never thought that would ever come to the foresight of some of the people I talked to. Um, I think I agree with several of the aldermen that it was a good gesture. It was, you know, we were meant to reduce, you know, the overall, we're trying to cut back. You know, this city needs to cut back. And I thought this is a good way. We're asking our, you know, everybody to freeze salaries, et cetera, et cetera. So after some serious input, uh, I will probably vote no on this as well. Any further discussion? Alderman Fanukin. I was the most uh, vocal proponent of this uh, ordinance change. I still am. Everything that I've seen from people and talked to people uh, on a couple of social media sites and talked to other people have said uh, that the amount of money that we're paid shouldn't be a draw for people to come on. The common phrase was, it shouldn't be the money that makes you want to do this. You know, this isn't the city of Chicago where they get $110,000 uh, each. This is the city of DeKalb, uh, lowering it a little bit. Yeah, mostly a symbolic issue, but still, all we ever hear is we need to cut expenses, cut expenses. Here we are trying to do that a little bit. No, it's not a lot of money in each of the next two years, but it is something. Uh, so I will still vote in favor, though it looks like it will probably fail. Thank you. Any further discussion? If you recall, on first reading, approval was given to a 10% uh, reduction in salaries starting in 2021, but, and that passed by a 42 vote. This is second reading. Hearing no further discussion, roll call, please. Perkins. No. McAdams. Yes. Furbick. No. Favor. No. Morris. No. Finucan. Yes. Smith. No.
I have two I and five nay. That ordinance is defeated. Item L, ordinances, first reading. Number one, ordinance 2020-066, approving the rezoning of 200 South 4th Street from the CBD Central Business District to the PDR, Plan Development Residential District, and the Plan Development Preliminary Plan, Johan DeKalb Suites. Motion, please. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Alderman Verbeek, seconded by Alderman McAdams. Mm -hmm. Smith. Smith. I beg your pardon? It was Alderman Smith. Oh, it was Alderman Smith. I'm sorry. This first reading of ordinance 2020-066, uh, the motion was made by Alderman Verbeek, seconded by Alderman Smith. City Manager Nicholas, please. Uh, Mayor, I, I think uh, Council Member Perkins put it exactly as I see it at this point. Um, I think um, we had an occasion where there was a, a good, a good a lot, a good amount of conversation at the plan commission level, and it, it continued in the days that followed and weeks really that followed, and uh, the neighbors who were had a front row seat to what was being proposed uh, met, expressed their their opinions, and then as uh, several. Uh, uh, revised designs uh, came their way. They added uh, more detail to their opinions and ultimately a new rendering showing a different layout uh, in terms of the site and then also the renderings, which interestingly um, comported with what the neighbors wanted. There, there was a little different design, but this is what the neighbors wanted. I don't know if they're still in the room. I think they're gone now. but. Uh, uh, working with Dan Olson uh, and, and being sort of uh, on the sidelines but watching very closely to these conversations uh, and the result of the conversations, I, I feel uh, pretty strongly that uh, we are at a point where this is an acceptable and agreeable uh, way to uh, redevelop that site and, and that the money would be well spent from our TIF program. So I recommend your approval. Alderman Morris. I, I just, I guess I want to echo what uh, Alderman Perkins mentioned about the collaboration and communication, as you said as well, Mayor. Um, I was really impressed as well. I listened to the, you know, whole planning and zoning commission meeting. I, I spoke with all of the uh, no votes to understand why they really voted no. And it was exactly what Pappas has addressed with his um, adjustments. It was that it was too dense before, that it was not respecting the park, and that parking along with the excessive density was an issue. And so all of those appear to be addressed in this new uh, situation. Um, I'm not sure if uh, Kat Prescott, who was on the call before, was able to hear uh, Mr. Pappas's response when he responded to uh, Alderman Verbeck's question, which Alderman Verbeck asked if, if asked Mr. Pappas if there was a way to address her concern regarding uh, there being two ways in and out of the space. And um, so Mr. Pappas addressed that by noting that uh, for fire safety and for police safety, it was important to have um, two entry and exit points to the development, which I think makes a lot of logistical sense to me as well. Um, I could see if you only had one entry point, then that could be extremely dangerous if no one can get in there. Uh, so I am very impressed with these adjustments and very pleased with it. I just want to demonstrate that. Thank you, Alderman Morris. Any further discussion? If not, roll call, please. Verbeck. Yes. Favor. Yes. Morris. Yes. Sanukin. Yes. Smith. Yes. Perkins. Yes. 
McAdams. Yes. Mayor Smith. Yes. Adot. Thank you. That ordinance is approved on first reading. I'd like to uh, move that we waive a second reading and approve. Second. It's been moved by Alderman Finucane and seconded by Alderman Morris that we waive second reading and approve this ordinance. Any further discussion? Seeing none, roll call. Saver. Yes. Morris. Yes. Finucane. Yes. Smith. Yes. Perkins. Yep. McAdams. Yes. Furbick. Yes. Mayor Smith. Yes. Eight I. That ordinance is approved. We move along now to reports and communications, allowing our city council members and our staff to make any uh, comments they'd like. First of all, our first ward alderman, Carolyn Morris. I just want to note that the demolition uh, has begun and I haven't driven by there lately, but maybe it's even done by now. Almost. Almost done on um, campus cinemas. Mm -hmm. So we're making a lot of progress in the first ward. I just want to draw everyone's attention to that. Opportunity DeKalb is the organization that has um, formulated from the Annie Glidden North Revitalization Plans, final plans, so Opportunity to Calb has been working very hard to make progress in that area, uh, which is the first ward is predominantly comprised of. So I just want everyone to know that we are working very hard to make progress there and things are coming together and it's really exciting to see. Thank you, Alderman Morris. We appreciate your help, everything you're doing in your world ward as it relates to the continued revitalization of Annie Glidden North. Alderman uh, Bill Finucane, Ward 2. Thank you. Uh, first of all, Alderman Morris, welcome back out of quarantine. I know what that's like, so I'm glad to see you here. Along those same lines, though, as we've been reading, COVID-19 continues heading in the wrong direction. Please wear your mask as required. Uh, this week, there is free testing available the next three days. Tomorrow, it's at Sycamore High School, and then Wednesday and Thursday, up in Genoa. Continue to support your local bars and restaurants through patio dining and carry out. It's very important for our local economy that we continue to support those so we don't lose those businesses in the long run. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Alderman Smith, third ward. Uh, I want to say I sat through the uh, webinar by Dr. Powell the other day and I was uh, very enlightened and uh, from the people that spoke and Dr. Powell's uh, presentation overall. I won't go into a lot of details, but I think it's out there to be for Down everybody else site. to view, right? I think it was five, almost pushing 600 participants, am I correct? Over 500. Yeah, it was uh, very enlightening. So if anybody gets a chance to review it, uh, it, it would be a great idea for the community as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Smith. Alderman Perkins, Fourth Ward. No report. Scott McAdams, 5th Ward Alderman. No report. Mike Verbeek from our 6th Ward. Well, speaking of demolition, about a year ago I reached out to the owner of the Travel Inn in Ward 6 in DeKalb, uh, just offering if there was anything we can do to help with that property. Uh, I want to thank uh, City Manager Nicholas and uh, staff for working with the owner of the Travel Inn and helping facilitate now uh, hit the property and its demolition. The fence is now up mm -hmm. around the entire perimeter of the property mm -hmm. as of today, and uh, demolition should begin uh, soon. Also, I want to thank uh, Andy Rye. Andy has done a great job with uh, getting uh, workers in place to uh, neaten up our islands in Ward 6 in the Knolls. Uh, we've had, we had a challenge with the contractor that was set up to do that work this year and I'm happy to say that we've got somebody else doing the work and doing a, a terrific job. Thanks again, Andy. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Alderman Favor, 7th Ward. <clears throat> yeah, tomorrow night is the uh, airport advisory uh, board meeting out at the airport. It's at 7 p.m. in the uh, East Hangar. 
Um, so if you want to come out and see what uh, what's going on at the airport, I would invite you out to meet. Thank you. And I believe today was the first day, was it not, uh, all Andy, uh, of uh, our leaf collection around the uh, city. So congratulations. Let's hope the snow stays away and allows us to pick up uh, most of the leaves around town this uh, this year. I, looking out here, I see a lot of masks and of different varieties. There's going to be even more masks this Saturday as some of our trick-or-treaters, those who uh, have been given permission from their parents to go out and uh, do their deed, if you will, uh, three, 3 to 6 p.m. in the city of DeKalb. 3 to 6, should still be light by 6 o'clock, just getting a little bit dark. Uh, we uh, ask everyone to be safe, wear their masks uh, of all kinds, shapes, etc., for our uh, Halloween effort. And I tell you, I'm so proud of this council. I have been proud since the day I was sworn as a mayor to know who I was going to work with. And I tell you, the variety of opinion, the the ability, joining someone in our audience tonight, to change when we hear things and when we collaborate and when we communicate, it is so important. So kudos, to use your terminology, Alderman Perkins, to, uh, to our city council. I'm really, really proud of you guys. City Manager Nicholas. Just a couple quick things. Uh, the, the big three are coming down. Uh, the cinema's almost down and uh, travel in uh, on the way and 912 Edgebrook were out to bid for the demolition bids there. The funding is now all in place and thanks to Joanne Rouse for all of her help with the CDBG funding. It's been so vital to that. So by the end of the calendar year as we had discussed back in January and February we hope to get all three of those removed and, and better things hopefully in the, in the offing. Um, uh, one other thing that was on our minds when we were talking at the Finance Advisory Committee uh, about levies uh, was uh, where we would be with uh, Moody's because, as you know, uh, back in September of 2018, the city's uh, bond rating was put in, into uh, the doghouse, I guess you would say. We had a, a negative outlook. Uh, and uh, the promise was that Moody's would be back in about two years. Well, it's been about two years, and of course, we probably prompted uh, a new review by going for the refunding that is a big part of uh, the, the, the budget process currently. And uh, Moody's uh, had uh, their interview with me and with uh, representatives of the bond agency that we've been working with. We spent weeks pulling together some presentation books for them, uh, 30 pages or so, nice color pictures, lots of data on what we've done in the last couple of years. They were impressed. They removed the negative outlook. That's the good news. The bad news is because we live in the state of Illinois, because the state of Illinois' fiscal picture is not right, and uh, unfortunately because the pension crisis, which is at the legislature's feet, not ours, and for the fire and police pensions uh, is not resolved and at this point it's not clear when it will be resolved. They knocked us down from A1 to A2 and they have done uh, uh, rating downgrades across the state and that's what they're supposed to do because the people who buy the bonds that we're refunding or if there was a new bond issue from some other place, could be anywhere in the world. They're not going to take the time to call the city of DeKalb and ask us, how's it going with Facebook? How's it going with Ferrara? They look at the numbers, they make their judgments, their important fiscal decisions that they make, and there can't be any doubt. So uh, they were very friendly and very upbeat about our future, but they said, sorry, this is what we have to do. This is our business. So we, re we respect that. Uh, my feeling is that in a couple of years, we'll be able to go back and, and fix that. The pension situation is a situation that is, uh, it's a dilemma for municipalities across yeah. this state. And, and, and the, ball, the ball is in Springfield. The ball is in Springfield. Bill? And I, I, I'm sorry, Mayor, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, but the reason Moody's is concerned for us in that context is that the most reliable recurring source of general fund revenue is a property tax. You can vote that every year. Whether, whether you vote it too high or too low, you can still vote it. 
Uh, sales and use taxes are voted basically by the consumer. You're never too sure, you know, where you're going to be. And we've had to rely more heavily on sales and use taxes, which are of a volatile, variable source because of the conditions and economic circumstances we find ourselves in. And because we're doing the right thing when it comes to the property tax. So th that's good for the taxpayer from, this, from the years that Moody hears from. Uh, that's, that presents uh, us as having a heavy reliance on a source of revenue that we don't control. So there Thank you, you are. After I called on City Manager Nicholas uh, Alderman Verbeek sort of slid his chair over here and said, don't forget the clerk. How could I ever forget Lynn Fazekas? <laughs> Lynn, do you have any comments? Uh, no, I don't, but thanks for asking. Okay, thank you. Uh, with that, I would entertain a, we have no executive session tonight, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Alderman Verbeek and seconded by <coughs> Alderman McAdams. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Morris. Yes. Sanukin. Yes. Smith. Yes. Perkins. Yes. McAdams. Yes. Verbeck. Yes. Saber. Yes. Mayor Smith. Yes. Eight aye. Thank you. That motion passes and this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>